I spent a good amount of my life on a ranch in Colorado. We didn't want to live on it anymore. We couldn't, so we had to rent it out. I remember very vaguely, I was young, and this big, burly man came to the door when my father was interviewing people to take over the ranch. And he came in, and I remember he asked me to go outside, and I went outside, and there sitting in the guy's pickup truck was a smaller, smaller framed man. The big burly man had his hat in his hand, and he just kept on twisting it in his, in his hands, like, you know, run, running it over and over. And he wouldn't look my father in the face. And um, they went inside and talked, and I hung out and just sort of watched the guy in the truck, and the guy in the truck was trying to avoid eye contact with me. Eventually, my father finished the interview with the, the big burly guy and shook his hand, and the attitude of the guy changed dramatically from when he had entered the house. And he came back out, and he was, you know, much more positive and happy, and he looked to the guy in, in the truck, and he smiled, and the guy smiled back, and they got in the truck, and they turned around and drove off. And I said, Dad, well, what was that all about? He says, I think we found the, the new tenants for the farm. They had run their own ranch in the high country, and they were asked to leave. And I said, uh, why? And he said, because they are gay. And they didn't, they weren't, want, they weren't welcome. And I didn't know what the heck that meant. I didn't know what gay was. I had no idea. I said, so why are, is that okay? Are we, he says, yeah, of course. It's just, it's not none of our business. You know, I know he'll take care of the ranch. And I wouldn't say it was like I saw the injustice, but I sort of saw, it was kind of a reminder of, wow, this is really sad. It was really sad because these guys clearly had no ill will towards anybody. As a very young girl, I must have been about 10, maybe 9, 9 or 10 years old, and I remember my mom, who was pretty much a stay-at-home mom. She had been a teacher before she got married, and she had applied to be a kindergarten teacher at the school that was connected with the church that my father was minister of. She felt like, you know, she had reached the point where she could probably start working again because she really loved to teach and she wanted to get back in the workplace. So she applied for the kindergarten teacher position at the school, and she never heard anything and never heard anything and never heard anything. And she finally called one of the Board of Education members, who was also, you know, a member of the church. She was a minister's wife. And she just asked him, I, you know, I just need to know why you never contacted me about my application or said anything to me about it. And I remember listening to that phone conversation. I was standing in the kitchen watching her um, on the phone and listening to this and listening to how hard it was for her to ask this question. And then she got off the phone and she, my dad happened to be in the room and I watched them have a discussion about it. And she was told that the reason is because she's a mother and she needs to stay at home. Mm -hmm. And they don't, you know, and the, you know, that's why they didn't even consider her for the position. It had nothing to do with her abilities as a teacher. And I remember distinctly thinking at that moment as a young girl, I will never let this happen to me. And so that sort of, you know, carried me and... My name is Catherine Fry. I'm the Education Director of The Lamp. I'm DC Vito. I'm the Executive Director of The Lamp. Uh, we co-founded the organization. Um, it's an organization that is a mobile organization where we bring workshops throughout the city to youth parents and educators, helping them develop healthy, critical relationships with all forms of media so that they can be positive, strong consumers and producers of media. Specifically, the change that we'd like to see happening in the world, as I see it, is that people become more critical about the information that, they, that, that is given to them, that's provided to them through the media, um, that they think more about the way that it's constructed and with what intentions, and that they can kind of break it apart, but then take that critical understanding um, towards producing their own kinds of communication. You must be humble. You need to walk into a situation and be extremely flexible and forget about all your preconceived notions about how you think things should go the way that you've constructed them in your head. Patience is critical. 
And patience for a couple reasons. I think a lot of young folks who have this burning desire to change the world want to do it right now. And they're not going to be able to do it right now. You need to have a greater life experience because if you allow yourself to live a life a little bit, put yourself in uncomfortable positions, put yourself in places where you don't know what the outcome is, you don't know your comfort zone, learn and expand your horizons and be patient that eventually you will get to the point where you will. You'll have a much better way of approaching situations like what you're talking about. Figure out what the world is, figure out who you are, because up to this point, if you've been in college and you're just getting out of college, you've been sheltered. Until you're 22 years old, you don't know what the world is like. And if you don't give yourself that opportunity to find out what you are about, you're not going to be able to help other people.